Well, I would say I'm the only candidate with experience. We have to put action in our words and problem solve. In South Seattle's District 2, incumbent Tammy Morales is running for a second term on the city council. Yeah, I'm excited. Team Tanya! She faces challenger Tanya Wu, a community activist with deep roots in the Chinatown International District. Anyone hungry? This district has seen its share of challenges, and voters in the CID, Yesler Terrace, Mount Baker, Beacon Hill, and Rainier Beach must now decide who can best represent them. We're also doing a lot around housing. Will voters in D2 re-elect Tammy Morales or pick newcomer Tanya Wu? And so how do we build more efficiently? How do we build faster? The candidates debate. We really need to change the community conditions that are leading to violence in the first place. Electing the next city council member to serve Seattle's diverse District 2. Next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callahan. Incumbent Seattle City Council member Tammy Morales is in for a fight to retain her District 2 seat against community activist Tanya Wu. Morales, elected in 2019, took a majority of the vote in the August primary. But Wu is a well-funded challenger with deep connections in the Chinatown ID, Beacon Hill, and Rainier Beach. How do Tammy Morales' years of experience in office match up with Tanya Wu's claim that many D2 residents feel left out of city politics? This week, hear from both candidates in the race for District 2. I am the current council member who represents uh, District 2. Incumbent Tammy Morales. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Yeah. And um, challenger Tanya Wu both want your vote for Seattle City Council District 2. From Chinatown ID to Rainier Beach and Beacon Hill to Columbia City. People don't feel like they're being heard. I would say I'm the only candidate with experience in this race. Morales was elected as D2's council member in 2019 and won 52% of the vote in the August primary this year. She's endorsed by the stranger. At least half of our council members will be new, and I do think it's really important that we have uh, leadership, experienced leadership that has delivered. Wu, a community organizer who runs a business in the CID, came in second with 44% of the vote. She's endorsed by the Seattle Times. We're fighting for a seat at the table, and that's what propelled me to run, was, you know, we're, they're not going to give us a seat at the table. We have to fight for it. Morales, a mom with two kids in Seattle public schools, says her top priority is building what she calls healthy and safe neighborhoods. That is around housing, dealing with our homelessness crisis, dealing with, um, you know, the, the, the need for folks to feel safe and secure in their communities. But Wu, who volunteers with the Chinatown International District Community Watch, says her opponent hasn't done enough to keep D2 safe. I'm in the encampments, I'm on 12th and Jackson. I see the trickle down effects of bad policy and how it affects our community members and we need to do more. Morales touts her background as a neighborhood planner and her work to stop displacement while on the council. So many of the challenges that we see in the city right now really are around our housing policy, our transportation policy, how we move all those systems together. Wu's family provides workforce housing at the Louisa Hotel and she wants the voice of the working class and other marginalized groups amplified. And bring it down to the community level so that community members, people who are closest to the problems are being heard um, and their solutions are being considered. It's a four-year incumbent up against a longtime local organizer in D2. There needs to be more outreach and engagement, and that's what I've been fighting for. I'm excited about the opportunity to continue working on behalf of the people of District 2. And here they are with me. We have Councilmember Tammy Morales. We also have Tanya Wu, both running for the District 2 seat. We had a coin flip before the show, and Tanya, you will be speaking first. Please, a minute for an opening statement here. Tell us why you're running. Yes, my name is Tanya Wu. I grew up in Beacon Hill. I have a small business in the Chinatown International District, and I now live in the Rainier Valley. So as a community advocate, I've seen 
continued discrimination to one of the most endangered neighborhoods in America. I have pushed back against that and shown that we can win. I have also built housing. Uh, my family has the Louisa Hotel, which has 84 units of workforce housing, which only charges our tenants a percentage of their income so that no one's forced to pay a rent they cannot afford. I also know how to achieve better public safety with my group, the Chinatown International District Community Watch. We go out and work with our first responders, going into encampments, providing mutual aid to our in-house neighbors. We also provide support for our small businesses as well as our residents in the district. And so we need to get past our elected leaders telling us what they're going to do instead of showing up and listening to the community. We need to elect people who will do the hard work of governing and running the city. And my name is Tanya, and I promise to show up, work hard, and do what it takes together to uplift Seattle. Thank you very much for that. Councilmember Morales, tell us why you're running again, and please keep it to a minute. Okay. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, I am a mom with two kids in Seattle Public School. Uh, I've worked and organized in District 2 for over 20 years. I'm trained as a neighborhood planner, and that's actually the work that got me into uh, City Hall or interested in City Hall. Um, I have spent my first four years uh, working to stop the displacement that's happening in the South End, to stop the displacement of our black and brown neighbors and businesses. Um, it's the work that I came into office to do and what I've been committed to doing. So, for example, uh, you know, I've supported organizations like Africatown that are bringing black businesses back to the CD. Um, uh, you know, worked to get funding, a million dollars for apprenticeship programs for young people so that they have a career pathway. Uh, made sure that there was city funding for the Tubman Health Center so that there's access to health care in District 2. Uh, the work that I'm doing is really all about making sure that our black and brown neighbors can stay in the city uh, and that we're building healthy, resilient neighborhoods. And that's the work I hope to continue doing. Thank you very much for that. I want to run through some of the issues where you have some different stances. One of those is public safety. District 2 has seen a spike in gun violence this year, a shooting at a community healing space in Rainier Beach, more than a dozen home invasion robberies targeting the Asian community, so some big concerns there. Tanya, as part of the solution, you're talking about hiring more police to get the SPD back up to pre-pandemic numbers. Talk to us about hiring officers, the way you want to improve public safety in District 2. Yes, we need short-term solutions and long-term solutions. And in the absence of any other options, we need to include police in the short-term solution. We need reform in the police department. We also need more culturally competent training. But at the same time, we need to provide the resources and support for officers. In the long term, we need to engage community members and get community groups involved. We also need to provide more youth programming activities. We're not at that level from the pre-pandemic levels we're seeing in our community centers and our libraries. We need programs for youth. We also need to create that economic engine to help get our young adults into good jobs, training, apprenticeships. And we also need resources for people who are experiencing behavioral health issues or addiction issues. And so having a balanced approach, I think, is best. Just to make sure I'm clear on this, you are talking about trying to hire enough police so we get back up to pre-pandemic numbers. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. We need to get our call times down from seven minutes to, to four minutes as in pre-pandemic levels. We also need to make sure that, you know, we are able to respond to hate crimes and other incidences within the district in a timely manner. And when people call the police and are in need, that officers will show up. Okay. But we have to make sure that, you know, we hire good officers and while we come across problematic ones, we make to, need to make them accountable. Okay, got it. Uh, Councilmember Morales, I want to talk about police hiring and public safety. I think there's some nuance here in your response to this issue. Talk to me about what your opponent's saying. How's your approach maybe a little bit different than that? Sure. Well, what my opponent talks about is there being an absence of alternatives, and that's just not true. Uh, we have funded the kind of youth diver uh, diversion programs, violence interruption programs, um, you know, alternatives, victim support services. Uh, in the last couple of budget cycles, we've put, f I think, between four and eight million dollars in to create a community safety initiative, and that is the kind of work that we really need to be supporting more. Um, because, you know, we, sure, we need police to respond to violent crime. We need to, we need them to investigate those crimes. Uh, but we really need to change the community conditions that are leading to violence in the first place. That's the preventive side of what we really need to be talking about and haven't been. Uh, and we need alternatives, uh, like the things that we've already been investing in, but we have to scale that up because, as you've said, there's a lot happening and those groups are proven to be effective at helping interrupt violence. Mm -hmm. 
and supporting families after, but they need more support, and that's part of the challenge that we face. Again, putting a fine point on it, do we need to hire police back up to pre-pandemic levels? How do you look at that? Well, the way I look at it is we have fully funded their staffing plan, uh, and they are trying to meet that demand, and, you know, I... We have, we have answered the question. Okay. We have funded the plan, and now they need to hire people. Thank so you. So Councilmember Morales okay. has voted to not fund police. It's in the records. Okay. Um, and you've been trying to take money away from the police department as early as last year in the budget records. And so I think we need immediate action now. We need to be able to chew gum and walk at the same time. Okay. And so we need to make sure that we are able to hire more. We did not actually defund police, that we demoralized police. 600 officers left the force. Okay. And so we need to do more to be able to make sure we have the support and the resources um, and pr promote not only community programs, such as my group, the Community Watch, mm -hmm. who go out there and patrol and help first responders, but also make sure that we have a fully staffed police department. Councilmember Morales, I want to make sure you get a chance to respond to that if you'd like. Well, again, I will say that we have fully funded the department. Um, and, you know, what we're really talking about here is accountability. So I think all of us can agree that we have seen plenty of video, heard plenty of audio, uh, particularly in the last few months, that demonstrates why I will never stop demanding accountability for this from this department. You know, they receive 50 percent, almost 50 percent of our general fund. And I think it is my job to ask the question, how do we hold them accountable? Uh, you know, what measurable increase in safety are we seeing for that enormous investment, given the fact that we are talking about wanting to invest in alternatives and we don't have the money to do that. So this is about fiscal responsibility and it's about accountability for a department that frankly has a very toxic culture. When they are, uh, you know, electing leaders of the police guild who are harassing Asian neighbors and l mocking people who have been killed by a police officer, we have a problem and we need to figure out how to fix that. Thank you. I need to move on to another issue here because I know there's some other differences and I really want to get to them, Tanya. But let, let me jump in if I can because here's an important one here. Councilmember Morales, just talking about this, you were one of three no votes on the recent drug possession and public drug use law that the council passed in September. This measure, in accordance with state law, allows the city attorney to prosecute those drug cases as gross misdemeanors. Supporters of the law say it also encourages a public health approach like treatment or pretrial diversion. Please explain your concerns over this new drug law and why you cast a no vote. Well, this is the issue. This is a public health crisis, and it needs a public health solution. Putting people in jail for having an addiction to drugs is not going to solve the problem for them. And while we were all hopeful that the mayor's proposed budget would include funding for increased diversion services, for mental health treatment, for, uh, you know, street outreach, that's not in the proposal at all. And so, you know, it feels a little bit like a bait and switch that there was a lot of promises made about what would come after we voted for that bill and none of those promises materialized. Mm. So, um, you know, if we're going to be really addressing the issue of drug addiction, of, uh, you know, supporting the people on our streets and getting treatment and getting into services, then we need to fund that again. Where the money's going to come from is a question. Uh, but just putting people in jail and giving our city attorney prosecutorial authority to move them into jail is not a solution for anybody. Thank you. Tanya, I wanted to make sure I brought this up because you spoke during public comment on this measure in front of the council asking them to pass it, which they ended up doing. You've talked to me about some of the drug activity you've seen on 12th and Jackson, the CID as well. Talk to us about your support for the city's new drug law, how you think it's going to work, and if you want to respond to what your opponent's saying about it, please do. Yes. So fentanyl is really deadly. It's not a drug. It's a poison. We're seeing people die. I've done Narcan. I've done CPR on people who some made it and some did not. And it's just devastating what we're, what's happening out there. And fentanyl's been around for two years. And there isn't any other alternatives. I mean, we have, there's so many great ideas out there. And basically, we haven't seen it hit the streets. Um, and so I supported the drug ordinance because it is state law, and this ordinance allows for diversion and treatment versus going straight to arrest. And if we find out that, you know, the, the mayor's proposed uh, funding for diversion and treatment is not in the current budget, let's put it in there. How can we work together and have city council make the proposals to make sure that that portion of that bill is funded with alternatives in place for treatment diversion because that should be the first thing that 
people go to. And so we really need to get people in treatment. We need to get people in diversion. It's, okay. We have people dying every single day from fentanyl overdoses, and we have to do something. The time for action has passed. Mm. And so we need to act immediately. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I'd like to move on, if I could, to another big issue in the CID, for that matter, in District 2, the placement of a sound transit station for light rail expansion. In March, the Sound Transit Board voted to support building two light rail stations to the north and south of the CID, rather than building under 4th Avenue by the existing station there. So this north and south option would probably cause less of a disruption for Chinatown businesses with construction there, but that 4th Avenue option would create a much more efficient system with shorter transfer times. Tanya, where do you think this light rail station should go? Oh my goodness, there's pros and cons to both options. We're talking about one option that will that prive a whole community to transit, and another option that claims that, you know, if, if that station was built, will will cause displacement and gentrification. Mm. And so I think we really need to mindfully go forward in looking at the EIS. Um, the environmental impact statement. Yes. Please keep going. Yes. And so it's a very divisive uh, topic in the community. And I think we really need to have further conversations and really delve into the pros and cons of each station better um, and pick the one that's going to do the most amount of good mm. for the community. Do you have a stance on that? Which, which option you'd prefer? I am neutral at this point. Okay, so all right. I'd like to see what happens at the EIS. Okay, fair enough. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilmember Morales, I think you've spoken about this before, and I know you've spoken to people in the community. I wanted to get your take on this. Sure. Well, I agree. It is a divisive issue, and, um, you know, this is the challenge when, because communities don't always agree on stuff, but, um, you know, especially because the Chinatown International District is so frequently uh, bearing the brunt of these major infrastructure projects, um, it is important to try to figure out what where we can land on it. Um, I have been uh, in support of the North and South Station. Um, you know, I do think that when the EIS comes out, we will need to look carefully at what that means. Uh, and I think, more importantly, what we really need is for Sound Transit to be very specific in committing to mitigation measures uh, and to the community benefits that, uh, you know, community will accrue. Because we're talking about, you know, seven, 10, 12 years of construction, and uh, the community deserves to know what they're gonna get in return for all of that disruption. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna switch gears if I could to talk about homelessness with you both. City data shows this. District two has several neighborhoods with high concentrations of RV and tent encampments. I know you're both aware of this. Council Member Morales, I wanna talk about this with you. Let us know some of the work that you've done on this issue while in office, what you hope to accomplish if you're reelected. Sure. Well, you know, uh, Tanya just mentioned that there aren't alternatives, uh, you know, that we need to really get programming out. And I think this is part of the challenge because for four years, the city council has been advocating for things like more tiny house villages, more RV uh, safe lots. It's important that we build housing uh, to make sure that we have folks moving into affordable housing and permanent supportive housing. In the meantime, we need more short-term solutions. We need sanctioned places for people to go, like a tiny house village, so that they have access to services, bathrooms, kitchens, um, you know, so their social worker knows where to find them when they get access to resources. And that's something that we've been calling for for four years. The previous mayor did not like that idea and wouldn't fund it. We've put money in the budget to do this in the past. And so there comes a point where the council can allocate resources, the council can pass policy, but if the mayor isn't executing those plans, then nothing happens. So I really think it's important for the viewing public to understand that council has been working very hard on these issues. And if we run up against barriers to implementation, that's a conversation that we have with the executive or with the departments to understand what the holdup is. Okay. Um, but, you know, the the temporary solutions and then much more investment in street outreach, diversion, and um, the kind of things that can help get people into uh, shelter or permanent, permanent housing. Thank you. Tanya, some thoughts about this, your response maybe to what your opponent's saying, and how would you approach the homeless, homelessness crisis differently than the city is now? Well, I'm out there in the encampments. I'm out there trying to provide aid to our unhoused neighbors and trying to connect people to resources. And so I see, I go to the camps, I see people who are in need of, of resources and I see the people who prey on our unhoused community. And so we really need to go out there and make sure that we do the outreach and the engagement consistently to make sure that, you know, people are building trust. People have been through a broken system. They've gone through, uh, you know, gone through shelters and gone through housing and, and end up back 
living on the streets, it's inhumane to let somebody die in a tent. We need to make sure that we're out there building up trust, building up relationships, get people to come inside and accept resources. And so I think we need more social workers, we need our caseworkers, outreach workers out there. Alternatives to policing is desperately needed. Uh, the social workers especially, separate from the police department, but also have um, resources similar to the police department as well, and making sure they're being paid a living wage job. I agree that we need more tiny home villages and RV safe lots, and we need to support those programs that build and maintain those um, lots. Okay. And so we also need to make sure we prevent people from becoming unhoused in the first place, rental assistance, helping our seniors uh, be able to get more resources, vouchers have been amazing as well, and also private-public partnerships. Um, the Louisa Hotel, we work with a group called Housing Connector. Mm -hmm. We house about 20 formerly unhoused residents, and so it's an all-above approach, but we need to really fund these programs and really make sure that they're out there and doing the work. Thank you, and maybe I can stay with you, Tanya, to talk a little bit more about housing affordability. You mentioned your family owns the Louisa Hotel building, and I think about this with District 2, the city's comprehensive plan shows it has several neighborhoods at risk of displacement. This is very real, people getting priced out of living in this area. If you're elected, what more would you do? What could the city do to try to make Seattle more affordable? Yes, in terms of gentrification displacement, I think we have a lot of racist zoning uh, policies in place. I want to go back and re-examine, look at a neighborhood neighborhood basis on zoning. Um, there's a gentrification and displacement map, and the pandemic kind of triggered uh, disaster gentrification. And it really shows what's going on in District 2 there in terms of the possibility of people getting pushed out. Yes, and so we have to go neighborhood neighborhood basis and look at our zoning policies, look at what's happening in the neighborhoods and talk to neighbors and see what they want to see in their community. Um, there are several neighborhood plans that we really need to delve into and really be able to enforce. Um, in terms of building more, we have to build more housing and affordable housing. And so I love the incentives like new market tax credits, MHA, MFA. We need to take away that percentage that allows developers to pay instead of building more affordable housing, force people to build affordable housing, and also streamline the permitting process. It takes anywhere from two to six years to get a permit, depending on how large your project is. And every single year that someone's waiting for a permit, costs go up by 30%, hard and soft costs. Okay. And so how do we build more efficiently? How do we build faster? as well as allowing for our small families who own property to be able to build duplexes and triplexes, and how do we make sure they have the resources to do that? Okay, thank you. Councilmember Morales, I wanted to make sure I made mention of the fact that you hosted the first gathering of Seattle's Social Housing Board a few months ago, the group in charge of the new social housing developer that city voters approved earlier this year. The developer, certainly an important tool for the city potentially when it comes to affordable housing. I'd like for you to tell us maybe about that and your work overall in affordable housing. Sure. What are your plans to try to ensure Seattle is an affordable place to live. Yeah, well, you know, we've, we're dealing with the crisis of 60 years of bad federal housing policy and disinvestment. Um, and part of the challenge with the way affordable housing is built is that it does rely on, you know, investors to purchase tax credits and, you know, this very complicated and arcane system uh, that stacking capital and it's complicated and it takes a long time. The purpose of the social housing uh, idea and, the, and what we hope to do with this is to take all of that out of the equation, to take the purchase of land out of the equation. And so, you know, the goal here is permanently affordable housing uh, for a range of incomes. And the reason it's permanently affordable is because it is on city land, city owned land. Um, uh, or it can be, you know, something that is a partnership to, to purchase land, right. uh, but it is in ownership, community ownership. Uh, so that's a huge part of the challenge, right, is taking that, that very expensive cost out of the equation. Mm -hmm. um, so the Social Housing Board is set up, you know, it is getting started, it is definitely in startup phase right now, but the idea is to purchase housing, uh, to, to make affordable uh, units across the city. Uh, I'm also working on a piece of legislation that we're calling Connected Communities that will do, it is basically a pilot program that will do something similar in allowing for uh, a, a private developer who is willing to partner with a community-based organization to get density bonuses if they agree to have this range of incomes available and if they put the housing in neighborhoods that have historically prevented apartments from being built in them. Thank you. I know a lot of work's going on in this department, but I did want to see if I could touch on a 30-second version. I hate to rush you, but <laughs> is there an issue? We're talking about some of the big issues I know you've been talking about on the campaign trail. Is there one that we haven't talked about that you want to bring people's attention to, Tanya? Any thoughts on that? Oh, um, I think public safety is a huge one. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing at doors. We yeah. are 
past, we are getting very close to a record number of homicides, and one th more than one-third of them are happening here in South Seattle. Yeah. And so I think we really need to do more in terms of how do we do outreach and engage with the communities, how do we engage uh, our communities of color in the political process, okay. um, which is something I have been fighting for this past year, was having a seat at the table, having representation, especially for the Chinatown International District and other communities. How do we get people engaged in the political process and, and have them aware that they could you know, come and fight for budget funds and enact change? Okay, thank you very much for that. 30-second version, if you can, something that might be beyond some of these bigger headlines. Well, I think a big issue in the city is affordability. And so, you know, uh, next year we'll be talking about the comprehensive plan and how we allow for housing growth and transportation issues. We also have the transportation levy, mm -hmm. and we will be implementing the housing levy um, if it passes. Uh, and so, you know, all of those are issues that will help us address the affordability crisis that we're having. And I think it's going to be a really important time for folks who uh, understand how all these systems connect. Uh, to be making those decisions and having conversations. Thank you very much for that. We need to start wrapping up here, and I wanted to make sure I touched on a few things. Tanya, let me go with you first for a closing statement here. And I wanted to mention to people, you've raised about $164,000 for your campaign as of early October. I want to talk about endorsements, if you could, off the top here. Maybe your top three endorsements, what voters should see from that, and if you could help us wrap up here with a little bit why voters should be supporting you as well. Yes, I, I am so honored to have endorsements of very many community members, of uh, unions as well. Um, I have three most proud endorsements. Uh, Representative Sharon Tomiko Santos, uh, who's a longtime member of the community. Um, I'm also endorsed by the firefighters um, who, who believe that we need a stronger public safety stance and, and due to my work in the community regarding public safety for years. I'm also really proud to be endorsed by former Representative Don Mason, who removed her endorsement from my opponent to give me the sole endorsement because she believes that we do need to do more for, for what's happening on 12th and Jackson because Summit Sierra Middle school, High School is right there, as well as, you know, doing more regarding the fentanyl crisis that we're seeing in our streets. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Councilmember Morales, you've raised about $144,000 for your campaign as of early October. I wanna talk about your supporters, if you could, three endorsements and uh, what you think voters should uh, draw from that as we wrap up here. Sure, well, uh, I have the endorsement of over a dozen labor organizations because of the work that I've done uh, protecting workers and making sure that our working families uh, can afford to stay in the city. Uh, you know, I am endorsed by environmental organizations, democratic organizations, um, and uh, King County Council Member Zahalai, with whom I have worked closely on uh, advocating for young people and worked really closely on addressing some of the issues in Rainier Beach. Uh, so, you know, I am committed to making sure that we continue to fight the displacement that's happening, uh, particularly in District 2, and make sure that our uh, communities of color can stay, and really excited about the opportunity to keep doing that work. Thank you very much to both of you, and we will be right back. What are people saying on social media about the two candidates for Seattle City Council District 2? One pair writes, Tammy governs with transparency, and she values community collaboration when addressing our district's toughest challenges. Another says, Seattle needs more practical folks like Tanya Wu to help bring back the previous version of our beautiful city. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on social media. Coming up next week, incumbent Andrew Lewis survived a six-way August primary to continue to represent Seattle City Council District 7. He faces off with challenger former Naval Officer Bob Kettle on the next City Inside Out. I hope you join us. <laughs> 